Hello, welcome back to the third video of the series in um, network security as part of CSC 280, Introduction to Cybersecurity at Adelphi University. Initially, I thought I was going to be able to cover this topic in three videos. Turns out it's going to be four. Um, I'm going to move some things around, um, but we'll make sure that everything gets covered properly this way. In the previous video, we talked about um, the Internet's architecture and in particular how routing takes place. Before that, we talked about uh, the DNS system and how it can uh, translate IP addresses to names and vice versa and do all kinds of other lookup functions. Today, we're going to look actually firsthand at these tools um, and we're going to look at several of them. Um, some of them we have already talked about, like the DNS uh, tools that are built into your operating system. Um, others um, include things like the ping utility and the traceroute utility. There are probably other diagnostic tools built into your operating system, but for the scope of this course, just knowing how to find your way around these three, these three utilities, ping, traceroute and NSLOOKUP, uh, would be good enough. In particular, the ping utility um, is uh, determined, um, is used to determine if a computer out on the internet is able and willing to respond to you. Um, Traceroute can help figure out which of these routers um, that we see as part of the internet um, your network traffic is passing through and in what order that is happening and how fast they are and all that kind of good stuff. And then the NS lookup is used to interact with the domain name system. So we'll look at each one of them briefly at a time. First we look at ping. Ping is a fairly simple utility to use, although it has a lot of capabilities. It's also giving you a lot of diagnostic output that you can look at um, and really try to interpret. The way that ping works is it's going to send a special network packet from your computer to a remote system, or maybe to your own computer too, um, and ask it, hey, are you there? And if that packet reaches the computer, and if the computer decides to respond to you, and if that response is able to make it back to you, only when those situations um, are met, then you can certainly say, yes, there is a computer on the other side, and it is willing and able to exchange information with me. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't mean that there is no computer on the other side. It also doesn't mean that the computer isn't willing to exchange information with you. It also could mean, for example, that there is a network interruption in between, or maybe that the network infrastructure, the routers, prioritized different traffic over yours and said, okay, I'm not going to do this last little bit, these ICMP packets, as these special packets are called, because I'm too busy with the ones that are more important. When you use ping, the only real meaningful feedback you get is the feedback that says, yep, I'm here, I'm able and willing to talk to you. The lack of a response doesn't really mean a whole lot. In the slide here, um, we'll see a quick example of me pinging uh, google.com. Google is one of those domains that is actually willing and able to respond to ping messages, and not everyone does. And this was done from a Mac, so um, uh, for Mac users, if you open the terminal utility, and then you can just type the command ping space dash c space five space google.com, and that basically means I'm going to send five of these packets to Google and I'm going to wait for five responses from Google to see if they all make it through. And in this particular case, you see a whole bunch of stuff happening. On the one hand, you see me issuing the command and then you see, OK, I am pinging Google.com. And then between parentheses, you see 142.250.64.110. So the ping utility has done an endless lookup in the background to translate the name to the number. But it's also telling you what that number is. That's useful. It's going to tell you that it's going to send 56 bytes each time that it sends something to Google. And so what happens is it's going to send those 56 bytes and it's going to ask Google to send those exact 56 bytes back to me. Now, the 64 bytes that you see there, that's just some overhead. And you'll clearly see that sequence number zero, the first one, um, came back. Um, TTL equals 115. That means that I'm willing to wait 115 milliseconds for Google's response to come back to me. If it takes longer than that, I'm going to assume that Google is unreachable. 
But in this case, time equals 11 point something milliseconds. I got a response back from Google in less than 12 milliseconds. This is the round trip time. This is the time it took for me to send the packet to Google, for the packet to travel to Google, be processed there, and the response to be sent back to me. That is the round trip time. And I did that five times. In the end, the ping utility is nicely enough to average this stuff out for me and to tell minimum and maximum response time, so I have some indication as to how quickly I'm getting a response back. This ping utility is built in to most modern operating systems. If you're on Windows, you go to either PowerShell or your command utility, and you give that a command. On the Mac, like I said, it's from the terminal. On a Linux box, it's just from your shell, or from your X terminal, or whatever you, you have as a preferred um, interaction mechanism. So let's take a hands-on look at the ping utility. As briefly mentioned before, if we want to figure out if there's a host, a computer remotely on the internet that wants, and we want to figure out if it's able and willing to talk to us, we can open a terminal. In this case, I'm doing it on a Mac, but if you open, if you're on a Windows machine, you could use PowerShell or Command Utility and just type the exact same command. We could type ping dash C and then the name of the remote system that we're interested in. For example, we might be interested in figuring out whether or not moodle.adelphi.edu is able and willing to talk to us. Of course, it would happen if I actually type the number there. There we go. So I'm just asking it to count, the dash C is short for count, five packets and send it to moodle.adelphi.edu. And we see exactly the same thing we saw before. So this is my command over here. It actually turns out Adelphi's uh, Moodle is not just called Moodle, it's actually called Moodle-VIP. Not sure why, but that's what it is. The IP address of the server is uh, 192.100.55.209, and we are going to send a number of uh, network packets to it. The time to live is 51. In this case, we're going to see that the first packet came back after about 13 milliseconds, but then the next one took 28, then 21, 22, 20, and then 17 again. Now there's some variability in how quickly these packets come back to us. That has everything to do with other things that are going on on my computer, other things that are going on on the Moodle server, or anywhere in between myself, uh, my computer, and the Moodle server. But you know, once you send five or maybe 10 of them, you can start seeing that the minimum round trip time, so the fastest that we heard back was within 13 milliseconds. On average, it took 20.9 milliseconds to hear back from um, Moodle. The longest it took was almost 30 milliseconds, 28 point, uh, really 29.0. And the standard deviation, which is an indication for how widely spread these numbers are, was about five milliseconds. So a very simple tool um, that can be very, very useful, depend just to see if you can reach a machine. The second utility that um, we can look at is called Traceroute. It's a little bit more complex, um, but you basically on a Mac type Traceroute, one word, um, space, and then the host name or the IP address of the machine that you want to trace your route to. On a Windows system, it's trace RT. Both of them happen from the terminal or the command prompt again, just the same way we did before. Trace RT is a leftover from Windows when they still had this eight character limit uh, on file names that has long gone away, but for whatever reason, trace RT is still trace RT. So if we look a little closer at what this means, um, it means that for each of those uh, rows where it says one, two, three, etc. It's able to identify what router I'm using um, next. So for me at home, the first router I see is router with IP address 192.168.0.1. Then that router hands it off to a second router. It's called 192.168.1.1. And then you see 10.240, and that turns out to be something that Optimum does, because that's what I have at home. And then it goes to 67. something, and basically step by step, each time 
just like we saw in that diagram in the last video. Um, trace route tells me what the next router is that I'm sending my packet to, getting closer to by destination at each step. Sometimes you'll see that it has an IP address. Sometimes you'll see that it has a host name. Traceroute will try to resolve the IP address to a host name, but if it's not getting a response back from DNS, it's just going to print the IP address. If it is getting a response back, it will print the host name. At hop number nine, you see three stars. And that means that whatever router was in use at hop number nine refused to talk to us. It didn't send anything back, but we knew it was there. So at that point, Traceroute really has nothing to tell you. It just puts a little star in and it moves on to the next one. What's interesting to see is that many of the ISPs and the backbone operators use some form of regional encoding in their host naming. So for example, um, we'll see that at hop number five, um, we're dealing with Opti33, so that's probably optimum, dot NASA, because we are in NASA County, CV is Cablevision, dot net. So now we know that we're in uh, NASA County through Cablevision.net. If we look a little further down, um, we'll see that after cablevision.net, we see Lightpath. So Lightpath is Cablevision's um, ISP. Actually, they're owned by the same company, so it's not really a surprise. But from Lightpath, we switch over, and then in the end, down the bottom in hop number 10, we end up with LGA34S blah 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 dot 1E100.net. Uh, 1E100, that's the Google. That's where Google got its name from, so that's a big number. Um, and LGA, that's LaGuardia. So that's a New York City, uh, or at least in the geographic region of New York City, uh, data center. And then eventually in there, we'll see the servers that we were tracing uh, our route to, um, with the last server about 10 milliseconds in response time. So we see that between me at home and Google's servers, the one that my information is being sent to, um, there are 10 routers in between. Um, and then the last step is when the actual data is delivered. Let's look at this in practice. Assume that we are looking to trace a route from my computer, the one that I'm typing the commands on, out to, let's say, the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. The University of Amsterdam has um, a host name called uva.nl, so we can try to ping that and see if something comes back. And it does. But we notice that the round trip time here has gone up significantly since the 15 to 20 milliseconds that we had seen before. That makes sense. It's further away. You know, there's a whole ocean in between. Now we're talking about 3000 plus miles away and it will just take longer for that signal to cross the Atlantic Ocean and come back. So by looking at the round trip time, you can also get some indication as to how far away physically located a server could be. But we're not interested in the round trip times per se, we're interested in the routes we take to get there. On a Mac, I would type traceroute.uva. Uh, traceroute space uva.nl. If I would have been on a Windows machine, I would have trace type traceRT. Since I am on a Mac, it won't work with traceRT, so we'll go with traceroute. And this goes very quickly. Now, what we'll see here is the same uh, that we saw in the previous slide. That makes sense. I'm still at home, still connected to my ISP. So my own first router and my own second router. My cable modem, getting to the infrastructure of my service provider, which is still located in NASA for cablevision.net. Cablevision passing off to Lightpath, its ISP, and then it switches over from lightpath.net to usman.nordu.net. Now, I don't know what that means per se, but my guess would be US being United States, man being Manhattan. Nordu.net is an ISP there. And then the next time is nl-sar.nordu.net. And you'll see that all of a sudden, the times it takes to connect and hear back from those systems jumps from about 18 milliseconds, maybe a little less, to almost 100 milliseconds for each of the packets that we send to Nordunet. 
on the NL side. And again, that is because there is a very long optical cable between the US and the, ne the Netherlands. This is where it's going onto the cable. This is where it's coming off the cable. And it takes about, well, this is about 80 milliseconds for the signal to traverse the cable from one side to the other. Nordunet then hands it over to Surfnet. Surfnet hands it over to the customer router. So this is the Surfnet backbone. This is the Surfnet customer router at the UVA, the University of Amsterdam. And that uh, lastly then shows you to um, their web server called ic.uva.nl, which refers, resolves to this um, IP address. But you can see what routers to play a role in handling this network traffic and getting it to its final destination. In this particular case, we see it takes 12 hops to reach the destination. In other situations, it might be a different number, but each one of those hops represent a place where the traffic is getting routed across the internet. NS lookup is that last tool that we talked about earlier, and that is what we use to interact with DNS. I don't have any slides for it, but so I'll jump straight in. What I'll demonstrate to you is how to do an A record lookup, A record lookup, sorry, and how to do an MX record lookup and how to interpret those results. NS lookup or name server lookup is another tool that is built into both Windows as well as Mac OS. It is also available in Linux, although on Linux it's typically an add-on that you'll have to install. Linux systems consider NS lookup as a tool uh, deprecated, and they have uh, uh, basically said we prefer you to use uh, either host or dig. Uh, NS lookup is pretty straightforward to use. Um, if I want to know, for example, what the IP address of Moodle.adelphi.edu is, I just type NS lookup Moodle.adelphi.edu. NS lookup is, in general, smart enough to figure out what it is that you're asking, and if it sees a uh, domain name here, it will try to look for the A record for that domain name. And in this case, it's telling me a whole bunch of information. So let's run through this. First of all, it's telling me that the DNS server from which it is getting this answer is 192.168.0.1. So if you're not sure what DNS server you want to use, the output for NS lookup will always tell you which one it is that you're using. It's also telling me that it is a non-authoritative answer, and that means it's coming from its cache. It's something that it has looked up before and remembered, but it has not gone back all the way up to the root domain servers and then down again to the Adelphi name servers to figure out what the answer was. This is a little bit of a special case. What it's actually saying is model.adelphi.edu does not really exist as an A record. Instead, it has a canonical name or an alias, uh, which is modelvip.adelphi.edu, which in turn, if you start looking for that, you're going to find the A record 192.100.55.209. Those are practices that sometimes system administrators use where they can start building a new system um, and then just at the end, just switch the pointer, for example, uh, to which it is pointing. Now, I could use a different name server if I wanted to, and I'll show you um, how to do that in a second. Um, but let's go the other way around. Let's say that I want to know what the host name is of IP address 192.147.12.4. That same thing that we just did where we looked for an A record for uh, Moodle VIP.adelphi.edu won't work anymore because an A record expects a host or a domain name, not an IP address. Again, NS Lookup is smart enough to recognize this as an IP address, and at that point, it's going to assume that you're looking for the other way around, the pointer. And it's going to tell me again this is a non authoritative answer, and the host name associated with this IP address is panther.adelphi.edu. If you look closely, this number here is the IP address in reverse. So 192.147.12.4. Um, that's just the way how that system works. So A records and pointer records are pretty easy to do, but you can also um, specify it directly. You, you can say, okay, I am explicitly looking for the A record for adelphi.edu. Adelphi.edu. And if you're going to ask for that, um, 
NS lookup is going to honor that. Although in this case there is no A record, it's a C name and a canonical name for iculus.adelphi.edu. And if I do that by hand, iculus.adelphi.edu is going to tell me again that's this IP address. Again, it's a non-authoritative answer. It's something that comes from the cache of this IP address here, of this DNS server. But uh, it's one way we could do that. We can also ask specifically for the pointer address for that IP address. And now we get a discrepancy. On the one hand, we say, hey, what is the IP address of iculus.adelphi.edu? And the response we're getting is 192.147.12.33. And then if we look in the other direction and say, hey, I have this IP address, can you tell me what host name it is? It's actually telling me www.adelphi.edu. So those are not the same. And that's a good indication that these two zones don't have to be managed in sync. In this particular case, we want people to refer to it as the www.adelphi.edu server, and that's why we're sending that name back. If I'm looking to send email to Adelphi, I can look for that um, MX record. So we're going to call Adelphi.edu. And it's telling me again the same thing. Hey, this report, the response came back from this DNS server. But now we have different answers, still non-authoritative because we've done this in the past. It's telling me Adelphi.edu has two mail exchangers. 10 delivery.adelphi.edu and 5 mercury.adelphi.edu. Because of this, I'm first going to see if Mercury is willing to accept my email. If it is not, I will retry it again with delivery. The lowest number goes first. You can do the same thing for mail.adelphi.edu. And so those are the same exchanges you see here. So Mercury and delivery in the same priorities 5 and 10. It's still a non-authoritative answer because it's coming back from my DNS server, not from the actual server in charge of this. I could do that. Um, I could, for example, change my DNS server to the Google DNS servers and have that do my resolution. So, for example, I can ask it to do uh, the same resolution again. Um, we already knew this. That's not particularly interesting. But now let's see what happens if we do this. And let's look up. Um, I'm going to ask for the name server records for Adelphi.edu. And it's going to tell me that these are Adelphi's name servers. So if I want to know any host in Adelphi.edu, I can go to any of these. Let's see if that works. And uh, sets the server to ns5.adelphi.edu, oh, 5, and let's look up Adelphi, uh, moodle.adelphi.edu now. And notice that that um, line that says non-authoritative answer is now gone. I have asked this directly at the name server who is in charge of adelphi.edu, ns5.adelphi.edu, and the warning that this was not an authoritative answer is now gone. In other words, this is an authoritative answer. So we've just looked at three diagnostic tools. We looked at ping to determine if a machine somewhere on the internet um, is able and willing to exchange information with me. We looked at trace route, which can be used to map out what path, physical path, or at least logical path we take over the internet in order to get from our source to our destination. And we looked at trace route, which will, um, sorry, we looked at NS lookup, which will help us interact with the domain name system in order to resolve um, queries, basically the lookup uh, records. In our next video, we'll look at network defense technologies. Very quickly, we'll skim through some of the commonly used technologies in network defense.